right, we have a few uh, more people joining. Continue to share about yourself in the chat, uh, name, location, associate organization. Uh, but Henry, whenever you have the chance, we can uh, we can begin. Uh, you're on and uh, introduce yourself and off we go, Jean-Luc. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you, uh, Henry. Uh, my name is Jean-Luc Purit. I use the he series pronouns. I am the president of the North American Indian Center of Austin. Also, I'm a visiting scholar, MLK visiting scholar at MIT's Department of Urban Studies and Planning. Um, and uh, pleasure uh, to be with here with all of you tonight. Uh, this forum is designed to introduce people to the major elements of the, cur the current housing crisis, homelessness, high rents, and a lack of low cost housing for renters and owners. We will also uh, present actions to end the crisis, emergency protections for tenants and rent control and new programs, community land trusts and social housing that offer real hope for the future. The forum is the joint work of the member organizations of the Massachusetts Progressive Action Organizing Committee, the Cape Cod and River Valley affiliates of the Democratic Socialists of America, Franklin County Continuing the Political Revolution, Massachusetts Peace Action, the North American Indian Center of Austin, Our Revolution, Progressive Dems of North America, and Progressive Mass. These organizations worked in collaboration with two major tenant organizing groups, City Life, Vida Urbana, and Homes for All, and with Representative Mike Connolly. Uh, so before we begin, um, as is our practice at North American Indian Center of Boston, we uh, start off everything that we do by recognizing the land that we're on. And of course, uh, you know, in this, uh, in the topic of tonight of housing security, we have to understand that is land that holds us and sustains us. Um, in Jamaica Plain, in Boston, we recognize that land as the, tra the traditional indigenous territory of the Massachusetts nation who continue today to, to this day in part through their lineal descendants, the Massachusetts tribe of Ponkapog. And in recognizing the land, we are making agreements with our host tribes. Uh, one such agreement is to support every effort by our hosts uh, to uh, rematriate land and natural resources back to the original peoples. So we have many different things to discuss tonight. Uh, really honored to be here. We first have a panel of uh, folks that are uh, here to present their personal experiences when it comes to their stories of the housing crisis. Um, the th three people that we have uh, to introduce are Annie Gordon, Sam Bishop, and Watertown City Councilor Carolyn Bays. Uh, so with that, I'm going to give the floor to Annie Gordon to kick us off in telling uh, about Annie's story of the housing crisis. Uh, thank you. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes, Annie. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as you know, I'm, my name is Annie Gordon, and I live in uh, Mattapan, Mass. Um, I'm associated with City Life Vida Urbana, and um, I joined them in uh, 2019. That's when uh, my uh, community or the complex that I live in was sold to a corporation. And uh, at, at that time, they just started, um, once they came in, they're, they're, the first thing they did was to send leases with very high um, rent increases. And most of the people in this community are disabled, uh, elderly and uh, working class parents that, you know, work, um, well, work for say like minimum wages or whatever. So it's kind of hard to um, have to pay those kind of, of rent fees. 
and uh, me myself being uh, a retired person, and I've lived here. It's the Fairlawn was the Fairlawn Estates. Now it's called So My F T Apartments, and I've lived here for fifty years. And uh, when they came, other than raising the rents, they rebranded the whole community from Fairlawn Apartments to So My F T. And this was done because of we think because of um, work that the community did to get a commuter rail station, which is just across the street from where I live. So um, my thing is it's um, unfair to the people that live here that they would be priced out of a community that they've lived in uh, for so many years. And really it's no place else to go to live because uh, basically rent's all over are the same. And I've never lived anywhere except uh, I I lived in Dorchester. I migrated here in from Georgia in 1971. I lived in uh, Dorchester and then I moved here to, in Mattapan to this complex where I've lived since then. So this has become my home, my community at a place that I'm able to um, move around because everything that I need is within a few minutes for me to get to uh, supermarkets, uh, stores, other stores, um, places of worship, my doctors and, and, and things like that. And um, it's um, very stressful and it's very frustrating that we would be uh, treated this way or, uh, and, and having no place else to go. I've never lived out, outside the city of Boston anywhere. I wouldn't even know where to start looking. And even the places that I applied to, oh, I'm sorry, even the places that I've applied to here within the city of Boston, there's all kinds of crazy waiting lists between two to seven years waiting lists. And um, I'm 72 years old now and uh, <laughs> waiting, I mean, you know, and I'm told in some of those places, you you know, there's not going to be any any vacancies because the people don't leave until they leave. And we all understand what that means. So I just um, find it very stressful and frustrating that it's able to be this way and with no place else to go. And there are other people in my community, as I said, my, my friends and all, we um, are all in the same situation. And I'm just um, right now, uh, dealing with a, a legal situation concerning this, and I'm just um, uh, I'm I'm frustrated and angry, but at the same time I'm a little anxious because I don't know how it's going to turn out. But at the same time, I'm hoping for the best. Thank you. Thank you. And um, just uh, I'm going to go to Carolyn, but uh, do we have Sam with us as well? Yeah, I'm I'm here. Okay. Um so what uh well let's um Sam are you, are you prepared to go next uh or I can just go to Carolyn. Maybe go to Carolyn. Okay. Back. All right. Uh so uh with that I'm going to uh turn it over to uh city councilor Carolyn Bays from Watertown. Thank you. Um it's nice to see everybody here. I I know I see a lot of familiar names. Um, a lot of you know me from my role in Progressive Mass, but I'm also a city councilor here in Watertown. I've um, lived in Watertown for the last 20, 25 years. Um, and, and I have watched as Watertown has changed drastically. When I first moved here 25 years ago, this was a middle-class community. And when I started knocking doors in Watertown and, um, and running for office, that middle-class community was dying and I watched it happen. I, I watched it happen every time I knocked a door and people, I, I had people crying on my shoulder because they were leaving, they were going, being forced out of this home that they had lived in for a quarter of a century themselves because they could no longer afford the rent because the the landlord was upping the rent. Um, they could, you know, their people's children could no longer afford to live near them. People could no longer afford the taxes. 
this community has changed radically, radically in the last 10 years. And it's changing from being a really nice middle class, you know, community that um, started as, you know, a place where workers would come and they could work to a place where the middle class can no longer afford to live. And, and I'm telling the story because I want to, there's a huge, the housing crisis in, in Massachusetts is affecting, you know, we think of it as affecting people who are at 80% AMI or area median income or 60%. It is affecting a huge proportion of the population of Massachusetts. You know, when a, when a city like Watertown um, can no longer, you know, be an affordable place for the, the average family, you know, it's, we're talking, we, we have a huge housing crisis here in, in Massachusetts. The other thing I want to say is that now I'm also, now that I'm, now when I'm knocking doors, I'm not hearing those stories anymore. The people have already left. Who were, who were facing those crises. They've been forced out of Watertown. Now I'm hearing different stories. The stories that I'm hearing now are, I will talk to a worker in Watertown and say, oh, where do you live? Thinking they live in Watertown. No, they don't live in Watertown. They live in, in you know, out west somewhere. They, I, the furthest out, I, I would talk to a worker who came in every day, she lived in Springfield. Um, People who are working in Watertown can no longer afford to live anywhere near Watertown and, and commuting distances vary quite a bit, but I'm hearing 40 minutes, 45 minutes, and like in Springfield, an hour and a half. The, this is a crisis that is affecting so many people in, in Massachusetts. It's, it's, it needs um, to be attacked in at all different levels, because right now we don't, we 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 do not have the solutions that we that we need for, for for all of the people who are being affected by this. And the other, the last story I want to tell you is a personal story of a friend of mine um, who ended up being homeless. He was kicked out of his apartment because he could no longer afford the rent actually actually he could it's not that he couldn't afford the rent they, they were renovating the apartment and this happens a lot renovating the apartment and going to up the rent and um he was going from house to house to house ours was one of the houses he stayed in i lost track of him and in february of 2020 i found he i unbeknownst to me he was homeless i did not know that i would have invited him to come back to our house. Um, and he spent the first six months of COVID homeless. And if you can, you can imagine how horrible that was. Um, it was a nightmare for him. It was traumatic. He, he, he was a good friend of mine. Like I said, he lived in our house for, for a few months, actually during his period, the period that he was homeless. I actually helped him get on the get on the list for public housing. And I'm happy to say that in um, the um, late summer, early fall of, of, of 2020, he did get into a Water, Watertown Housing Authority housing. And he is very happy that he's in there. Um, you know, whatever problems affordable that our Watertown Housing Authority has, that he is so happy to have a roof over his head. So he did end up in a good place, but only after after six months of hell being on the on the streets. So so I just wanted to sort of paint a picture of how vast this housing problem is. It's affecting everybody. And um, thank you for letting me talk. Thank you. And I'm just going to uh, check back in with Sam. Uh, are you there? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm here. I can I can speak. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, br I'll bring you on. Um, let me just go ahead and uh, pin your, there we are. Got your video pinned. Uh, Sam, take it away. So my name is Sam Bishop. I'm a housing advocate in Worcester, Massachusetts for the past two years. I've worked with the homeless and uh, with at-risk tenants through the Worcester Tenants Union 
and the Worcester NFI closure team. Um, I just want to say up front, I was not supposed to speak here today. We actually had a number of other speakers lined up uh, who were are currently facing homelessness. And unfortunately, they cannot speak for a very important reason that I will explain in a moment. But before I do that, I do just kind of want to go over what we've been facing in, in Worcester, Massachusetts. So we are the second largest city in New England. We have a population over 200,000 people. And in the past decade, uh, the city has been rapidly growing. And then with that, there has been rapid gentrification. So rents have been going up, homelessness has been going up. Currently in 2024, we have a homeless population four times the national average. And the city's response to that throughout this entire housing crisis has been to support gentrification efforts, support high cost standards of living rather than do anything to try to mitigate the problem. Uh, during 2015 and 2016, when the gentrification really started to ratchet up, and when there started to be a visible amount of homeless in the city, the city's response was to pass an ordinance that banned panhandling. And that ordinance was declared unconstitutional and the city was forced to pay around a half million dollars in a settlement for a lawsuit for arrests they made under that ordinance, rather than putting that money into actually solving the issue. Uh, the city in the past few years spent $150 million on a minor league baseball stadium the most expensive minor league baseball stadium in U.S. history uh, in an attempt to continue to attract people from Boston, people that have been priced out of Boston. And the end result of that was basically emptying out the Green Hill neighborhood. Uh, all the businesses around the baseball stadium, whenever there's a game going on, they have no parking. Many of them have been closing down. Rents have nearly doubled in the neighborhood. And all across the city, rents have continued to go up and go up. And there has been no response to that. Um, so when it comes to specifically the rise in the homeless in Worcester, a uh, number of homeless shelters in the city had closed at the start of the winter. Uh, there was Lyft, which had a shelter that was specifically for victims of, of sex trafficking that closed down. The emergency shelter that they opened last month uh, at the former site of the RMV right behind me, um, instead of having a system where people could come in and just say, I'm homeless, I need a place to stay. They use this lottery system and a waitlist system that basically meant that every single night there were people, you know, out the door in a line being turned away while there were empty beds because it wasn't a first come first serve. They're using this complex system. And these is only 60 beds for a homeless population around 800 people. And it is radically inadequate at its own, but even within those 60 beds, they're still not housing people. They're still leaving beds and people turning people away. And I don't know if the snowstorm that hit us hit everywhere else across the state, but over the weekend, there was a pretty severe blizzard. And during that blizzard, people were being actively turned away while there were empty beds in the one shelter that's in the second biggest city in New England. And in response to that, a number of the homeless decided that, you know, this policy is outrageous. There's no reason for it and vowed that they were going to set up camps basically in front of the shelter, uh, hoping that this would put pressure on the city to actually change it, to actually make it so there's a first come first serve policy rather than this complicated system that they were using that resulted in people being turned away in beds left empty. And last night, they set up around 30 tents for that. Um, we spoke to a number of people in city government about what we were doing to try to put pressure on the city to see if they could change the policy. And earlier today, uh, some friendly city councilors had a meeting with the city manager about that. And the city manager was told about all of the issues, were told about how people are being turned away. Uh, I heard personally a number of stories of people facing discrimination in that. There was one uh, transgender woman who told me that she was denied entry because she was transgender. They said, well, we have a male and female section. Since you're neither, we're gonna have to make a special section for you and we're not doing that. So you don't have access to housing in the middle of a snowstorm is what she was told. And uh, we conveyed these concerns to the friendly city councilors who spoke to the city manager. He said he would take care of the problem. And his response was basically around a half hour after that meeting, a number of Worcester police officers showed up and said that you have 30 minutes to move all of these tents or you're all gonna be arrested. And um, 
the homeless community stood strong and said, we're not moving. We want the policy change. We want a place to go. We have nowhere to go. And uh, in the past hour, uh, around 40 to 50 Worcester police officers showed up along with dump trucks and made a number of arrests of the people that were supposed to speak tonight to talk about their struggles and how they became homeless and talk about the end result of this housing crisis. And uh, as you can see across the street, there's still some, uh, I don't know if you can see it from this distance, but those are city utility uh, vehicles and uh, police cars that are continuing to uh, basically destroy all their belongings and trash everything in the tents. Um, they made maybe four or five arrests and then kind of the rest of the groups just scattered or were shoved off the property by police and left. Um, so that's, that's what we're facing in Worcester right now when it comes to housing and security. The, the issue is so bad that uh, we can't even have people speak about it because they're currently uh, in jail at the moment. Uh, so that's, that's what's going on on here. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you to um, Annie and, and Carolyn as well. Um, certainly, um, painting a painting a personal picture um, uh, across across the state here and and and, that, and highlighting um, not just the problem, but how uh, tenants and and people that are affected by displacement are um, getting organized. Um, at this time, I do want to uh, turn over to uh, Martin Omasta, who is a River Valley uh, DSA member, who will give us uh, the story uh, behind the homeless number. So, Martin, if you could uh, take it away. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Henry or Cole, if you bring up the slides. Awesome. Hi. Yes, I'm Martin from Hatfield. So we just got to hear directly from some amazing people that are dealing directly with the homeless crisis. And even though I could never begin to uh, step next slide, please. I could never begin to you know, describe the lived experiences of those without a home. Uh, we will try to encapsulate what all inadequately sheltered people go through uh, a bit. So yeah, advance the slide, please. Great. Uh, yeah, I mean, without a stable home, the average American will be out on the street in two months of no income, right? So many people are living paycheck to paycheck. It's humiliating and emotionally shattering. Your family heirlooms are gone. You can't store any important papers. Your identification is thrown to the wind uh, with an invalid address and ID. You feel rootless and alienated. You can't secure employment. Uh, you can't get mail. You're literally too poor to get a job. There's a sense of being exposed and naked, like the whole neighborhood knows your business and is judging you, but doing nothing about it. Step. Right. With no protection, your possessions are easily stolen. So you're always on guard. People spend all day doing basic survival tasks, looking for a hot meal, a warm place to sleep, searching for a bathroom or a place to shower. Depression can be cyclical right? with a constant reminder that you are nothing without money. You can't get anywhere easily. You can't even wash your clothes. It's just absolute chaos uh, with no escape or choice of the people around you. A step, right? But, you know, in contrast, what should it mean to have a home? Well, a home, you know, needs to be a place where people can gain and maintain the health they need to thrive and grow. It, it should put you at ease to help erase your anxiety and provide a loving ecosystem to let you feel safe. A home acts as a grounding place of consistency in your life while giving you a way to link into your larger community uh, where this whole system of now comfortable people are able to listen and work with each other with dignity as a given step, right? Because the big win means prioritizing homes for all, but we're not even close to being there yet uh, because when you're housing burdened, your stresses are high, so you have less energy and fewer resources to spend on your loved ones. In fact, here we see on this deck, 
a quarter of all Americans are housing burdened. That means step that 81 million Americans pay more than 30% of their income on housing. So I'm going to take a second here to orient us to the bar chart on your screen because uh, uh, we'll be seeing them for the next eight slides, right? So each column here in blue is showing those facing housing poverty. That, that housing poverty is those people paying more than 30% of their income on housing. So this is broken down into 10 categories, five by ethnicity and then five by shared characteristics. So we've got Asian, Black, Indigenous, Hispanic, White, and then by category, elderly, LGBTQIA+, veterans, families, and singles. You can see for yourself the numbers above each column, and those represent the size of each of those groups facing housing poverty in raw numbers. So rounding down, we've got 3 million Asian, 16 million Black, 2 million Indigenous, 19 million Hispanic, 38 million White. And just, I want you to please notice the huge amount of families that are struggling with 58.6 million, right? This almost certainly affects something you know. And next, we're going to look at these exact same numbers, but per capita by each of the group's population. Great. So those raw numbers we just saw kind of hide the plain as day chasm of the race inequality as shown here. Step, right? The numbers above the columns now are percentages. Each of those groups that face poverty of housing poverty. So the percentages of each of the groups, right? As you can see, when you compare the numbers between white and black and Hispanic, black and indigenous people are almost twice as likely than white people to have to pay through the nose just to have a place to live. Uh, Note, too, that Hispanic and LGBT communities are also heavily burdened by the housing crisis. Next, we're going to look at the same breakdown of data, but instead of for housing poverty, for people who you might traditionally call homeless. So this right here, this chart is the U.S. population that has no permanent residence. Again, raw numbers broken down into two groups, those who are completely unsheltered, they're in green and those who manage to find temporary shelter in orange. And so, so that means these numbers don't even include people like Carolyn was talking about, who for a while were couch surfing and other of the hidden homeless groups. Uh, step, take note, you know, black people are the single largest ethnicity in these categories. Uh, there you can see 156,000, 88,000. This is heavily driven by the US South. Um, all in all, on a given night, more than 600,000 Americans are homeless. And the elderly make up a huge group of this uh, as they can no longer afford the rising prices and they're forced to step out of homes they've lived in for decades. So right now we're seeing those numbers as per capita. And again, the percentages above each column, belie the inequity, the inequality between these percentages is stark. Hispanic, indigenous, and black communities face homelessness at two, four, and five times, respectively, at the rate of white folks. You know, the specific methods of this marginalization are different by community, but these numbers express the effects that a pervasive white supremacy ethos has had on our neighbors. Uh, step nationally, the Asian population, as you can see, is somewhat insulated due to a culture. Please go back. A culture of generational housing. Um, but we're going to see that as we change now to look at these numbers in Massachusetts uh, for the exact same four charts, that that's a big change. All right. Step. So here in Massachusetts, a third of our residents are housing burdened or, you know, facing housing poverty kind of using those terms interchangeably. And this harkens back to what our initial speakers were saying about. We have a huge population. That means that step 2.7 million Bay Staters pay more than 30% of their income on housing. Uh, the sizes of each of these columns, all right, from the population numbers roughly matches the national trends. But 
we have a hidden dragon in these numbers because we know that Massachusetts is the second wealthiest state in the union step. So despite 25% of people facing housing poverty in the nation, we're up to 33% here in Massachusetts. This is due to how the concentration of wealth in the hands of fewer and fewer individuals plays out in practice. Because we know that when a wealth gap becomes wide and perpetuating, then aggregate demand drops because poor people have to spend a larger portion of their earnings just on basic necessities. There's far less widespread and meaningful chance for social mobility and productivity. You know, the cost of living gets skewed as luxury houses, luxury goods, and other unproductive assets become prioritized rather than things like infrastructure, education, healthcare. This wealth gap also drags on our economy by causing deep negative impacts on our health and well-being, costing high fees, a lack of fitness to serve their nation and community, and huge social unrest. In fact, it, here in Massachusetts, it, it, there is at least a 10 percentage point increase in people who are struggling over every one of these 10 categories as compared to the national average, if you were to go back and look at the slides. But instead, step please, let's step. Let's look at what that means for people who have no permanent residence while in our commonwealth. Uh, similar to our state's housing poverty, these numbers roughly match the national trends. So we could see that on any given night step, uh, about 35,000 people in Massachusetts are homeless. Mm. But let's focus in on the families here, that small sliver down 218. That, it, can be a good thing, and this is based on all the data, because we have a decades-old right to shelter law in this state, you know, guaranteeing shelter to families uh, who have children in tow. But we're currently seeing that our Massachusetts shelters are maxed out. Uh, and as Sam was pointing, having, you know, odd rules set down on them, uh, we're at around 75,000 families due to this self-imposed limit by the current administration, which effectively nullifies that right to shelter law. Double step. Here we are again with per capita percentages of those same raw numbers again, and marginalized communities face no permanent residence at two to four times the frequency of you know more affluently insulated communities. And Asians here in Massachusetts are at least four times worse off than the national average for homelessness. Taking a second to look at the elderly, one mind blowing stat is that the elderly make up more than 50% of those people who come into centers seeking services and shelter. And the last slide step, so what does this all mean, right? We're missing out on $200 billion of annual GDP growth with at least $2 billion lost in annual GDP growth here in Massachusetts. So now a billion, is an insanely big number. But nationally, we are losing out on two trillion, two thousand billion dollars in lower wages and productivity by not having adequate housing for Americans. There's lots of reasons for this drag on the economy, but people not being able to locate near jobs that they're a good fit for and not having freedom of movement because they're tied to their employment are two factors. Kind of Specific to our old East Coast state, our Massachusetts homes are on average 54 years old, decreasing their usability. Uh, our, our next deeply devoted organizers will talk on how we can address that usability and other issues. I, I do thank you all for listening today. Jean-Luc? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Martin. Yeah. Hope everybody in the audience appreciates how great the challenge of homelessness is in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and that there are several populations at high risk of becoming unhoused. Uh, really appreciate uh, the numbers on indigenous populations here. Um, next, uh, we will explore the challenges of people who live in rental housing. Many are faced with sharply increasing rents 
and the threat of eviction. Still, others cannot find adequate housing at affordable rents. To discuss these issues, we have two presenters, Carolyn Cho, Director of Homes for All, and Mark Martinez of the Mass Law Reform Institute. They will talk to us about the protections that tenants need to survive this challenging economic period. They will also show us how cities and towns can win the rent control uh, that is fundamental to housing security in the state. As a third element of this segment, Mark uh, will show how, how many new housing units uh, must be built. He will also explain why for-profit developers cannot meet the need for uh, new construction of housing. So with that, uh, first going to turn uh, to Carolyn. Uh, thanks, John Luke, and it's so good to be with you all tonight um, and be gathering across the state on Zoom to talk about housing justice. Um, yeah, so much rich conversation in the chat as well as in the presentations. Um, you know, I think that the folks earlier laid out why we need rent control, right? I mean, we've all, uh, we've heard these stories, right, that we've experienced it ourselves that people's rents are going up. They're going up quickly. They're going up too much, right? People are getting pushed out of their units. They're getting pushed out of their neighborhoods, pushed out of their cities and towns, and we need immediate solutions. So, you know, we see, um, so I'm with Homes for All Massachusetts. We're a statewide coalition of tenant organizing and housing justice groups based in working class and BIPOC communities across the Commonwealth. Um, we have some of our member groups are here, like um, City La Vida Urbana, Springfield No One Leaves, uh, Lynn United for Change, um, New England United for Justice, and, and other groups. And we have been, you know, really thinking both, how do we address the immediate need now, right? Because the folks we work with, uh, the tenants and low-income homeowners that our folks are are organizing every day. They need immediate solutions, right? Uh, folks like Annie should be able to stay in their current unit, in their communities, and and continue to thrive. So, so we we see rent control and foreclosure mediation as immediate steps that we can take in Massachusetts to keep our people in their homes and communities, and then. Um, you know, we see that connected, right, to a lot of the broader stuff that Mark will talk about and, and presenters after that this is about um, addressing a crisis. And that means we don't just need to keep people in their homes now, but we need to have a different kind of housing system that meets our people's needs and is truly affordable to work to the working class and BIPOC communities that make Massachusetts uh, what it is and, and allow Massachusetts to keep working. Um so I'm going to share a little bit around rent control and what some of the dynamics are and and what we're trying to do, because we do think as part of a broader agenda that rent control is something we can do now that is going to build tenant power across the state and also keep people from the huge rent increases that destabilize our lives and communities. Um, next slide. So right, rent control has been a conversation in the United States um, since the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and, and I thought this, I will link to, I screenshotted this out of a presentation from the University of Minnesota that is about um, rent control in St. Paul where they pass by ballot rent control, but has a lot of good information. Um, and, uh, and this just kind of shows, right? So, you know, in the... Um, in the 1930s, uh, through the 1930s and 40s, there was rent control was um, uh, available, and then in the 50s, largely disappears. Right then, we see in the 70s, local programs are enacted um, due to inflation, social upheaval, and tenant organizing, which is where a lot of the programs we saw in Massachusetts, uh, many of you may have experienced. Uh, came to be. And then in the 90s, as we all know here in our local context, there was a lot of backlash, including the statewide ban here in Massachusetts and uh, Costa Hawkins in California, which really limits rent control there. Um, 
but we're in a new period, right? There was renewed interest after 2010 post-recession. And now in um, the in this decade, rent control is really uh, making a resurgence, right? Because we know that it was a coordinated effort to stop um, us from having rental protections uh, and, and something that we need to change. So next slide. So you can see, you know, Massachusetts within that, right, that we had rent control in Boston, Lynn, Somerville, Brookline, and Cambridge, and then through 93 in um, Boston, uh, Brookline, and, Cam and Cambridge. And right then, you know, in 93, we saw the real estate lobby take up a statewide referendum to ban rent control. Um, and that is why since 94, we have been fighting um, to bring rent control back to Massachusetts. And we have seen uh, what it has meant to not have rent control in Boston, Cambridge and Brookline, and of course, across the Commonwealth. Mm. So next slide. Um, so as I said earlier, right, I just want to really reiterate, these are things we can do right now that will keep people housed, will put people over profit but they are not the only solution and they are part of a broader shift for housing to be about people, not about um, developer profit. Next slide. So, you know, the, we're in a new moment, right? Rent control was something that for many years, folks in Massachusetts felt we could not talk about, right? After 94, it was just not on the table, right? We all, for those of us in Boston, we tried to move just cause we tried to move all these other things, just cause eviction and other policies because we thought rent control is not a word we can say here, but the t the terrain is shifting and the the st because the state of the crisis is so dire that we know that we need to do something now. And so, and, and I think even people who haven't often been on our side see that something has to happen. So, you know, there's been a rent control bill in the state house for at least six years and each session we've moved public sentiment toward rent control. And I think we are at a point where Rent control is one of the key policies on the table. It is something every candidate is asked about. And we're in a moment where we can really build the tenant power um, across the state to win. Next slide. And, you know, uh, as part of um, as some other immediate policies and and uh, that that we can implement include Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act, which uh, perhaps many other folks will also speak to, but is a way for tenants to be able to purchase their current building or have first right of refusal so a nonprofit developer or land trust could purchase with the tenants, right? And we know other tenant protections include right to counsel, so, you know, ha having a lawyer and eviction sealing, um, people's records. I would just note that the current versions on the table of both right to counsel and eviction sealing have some challenges, particularly eviction sealing, but we do hope those can move quickly. And again, these are all ways to protect tenants to keep people housed now as part of us moving toward more affordable housing at truly affordable levels, community ownership, and homes for all, um, including, right, housing our unhoused neighbors because uh, that's a critical part of the conversation and rent control will help stop additional homelessness but it doesn't produce new affordable housing units which is also key but just to highlight that we see tenant opportunity to purchase act um and right to counsel and eviction ceiling as other key tenant uh, protections that we can and and ways to, both tenant protections and then with topo ways to keep people in their homes right now. Uh, next slide. Uh, so just to kind of conclude on rent control, and I'm sorry I haven't been able to really track the chat, so I'm sure there's some questions that I can respond to af as as the presentation continues. Um, but I just want to share some of the components of. Um, Oh, sorry, this was not the last version of the slide, but some components of rent control policies and then the policy that Homes for All Mass put forward. So um, I, I see some of the key, or we, we understand some of the key components are having a cap on rents, right? That's what you think of when you think of rent control. So that can be a number. It can also be tied to inflation. 
Um, we ha- we think it should be tied to inflation um, in some way. Another key f- the piece is to ban no fault evictions or have just mm-hmm. cause for eviction. Mm-hmm. Those are the two ways we talk about it. Because if you don't include a, a banning no fault evictions with rent control, then you're not able then then landlords are just going to evict instead of raising the rent, right? We want to make sh- the goal is to keep people ho- housed and we want to stop there from being loopholes of that. So it's really important that there's um, a cap of some kind that we ban no fault evictions and there are always going to be some exemptions. So um, we, some of the things we've been thinking about are exempting owner occupied buildings with four or fewer units and exempting new construction for some period of time. Our recommendation is five years. The other piece um, is, is also vacancy control. So um, that is making sure that uh, when units, when people leave their units, that the landlord cannot readjust it to bump the rent up, right? That is called vacancy decontrol. And so, you know, that's really key, right? Because again, just like um, banning no fault evictions, vacancy control does not incentivize landlords to do things like stop making repairs so that people leave so a new tenant can come in, you know, those kinds of things we know can happen. So um, we have a bill that we've put forward and there are some other bills for rent control. The big thing here in Massachusetts is not which bill necessarily, but it's that there are components of, you know, of, um, of having a cap, having no fault eviction, abandoning no fault evictions, um, having some exemptions for small landlords or other folks and um, having vacancy control. We see those as key elements of rent control. And um, also, obviously, in our state, lifting the ban, because right now rent control is banned and every municipality that wants to pass rent control has to um, has to do a home rule. And we all know that home rule, it does not uh, work in our favor. And so right now we know that Boston, Somerville and Brookline have home rules uh, for rent control. And we hope more we know the more cities and towns are going to start having home rules. And we hope folks consider those parameters in their home rules. And we bring them forward as we also lift the ban so that in the future, those policies can move forward without home rule. Um, And yes, a home rule just means that um, in Massachusetts, those are things that you have to take to the whole state house, even if it's just for your city and town. So that means the whole state house has to vote on whether your city or town can do X, um, in this case, rent control. And so I'll just um, do my last slide and then pass it on. Um, you know, as we said, um, as I said at the beginning, right, we we are building a movement that is um, renters and working class homeowners who we call bank tenants, right? Because we know, and the foreclosure crisis certainly taught us, oh, sorry, in my back, I think I stalled for a sec. Um, okay. Uh, I was just saying on foreclosure, um, we know that we need to build with tenants and, um, working class homeowners because working class homeowners are bank tenants, right? And the, uh, 2008 crisis reminded all of us show revealed that mortgages are also, you know, um, uh, something that are precarious, right? And home ownership is an important part of the conversation and is not always stable. So we are we believe it's really about um, bringing working class homeowners and tenants together to fight for community stability for all of us. And part of that is also keeping homeowners housed. And so we've also put forward a foreclosure prevention program that requires um servicers to provide accurate loan information to homeowners and engage in foreclosure prevention conferences. It's pretty basic, uh, but we're the only state in New England that does not have this. Um, And so this is another program we're really pushing this session, um, complementary to a a big push now and a commitment to win rent control in the next few years. Um, So with that, I will uh, pass it to Mark to talk about some of the other policies. Thanks. Mark, you're muted. 
All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Martinez. Uh, so I am a housing attorney at the Massachusetts Law Reform Institute. Uh, we're a statewide anti-poverty anti um, advocacy organization. Um, and we also work a lot with the Homes for All Coalition um, a on a lot of their policy development. And so, um, you know, tenant protections are a huge part of what we do. Uh, you know, fighting for rent control is huge. Um, and it's a big part of what we need to stabilize our communities right now. Uh, but what we also know is that those things are not the long-term solution, uh, right? At the core of our housing crisis um, is that we have not kept up with housing production. As populations have increased, we've not kept up with housing production. And that's not a problem unique to Massachusetts. Um, that is a thing that is happening all over the country. Um but, you know, as is always the case, it looks different and presents differently a, uh, a few different places. And so what I'm going to talk about here is about um, not just creation of affordable housing, but another important piece of this puzzle is preservation. Uh, right. If we are looking at this kind of very simple equation of how many units we need in order for there to be enough housing for everybody in Massachusetts, um, there's right, there's what are we creating, but there's also what are we losing, right? We are losing affordable housing all the time, whether it be from um, expiring use, meaning deed restrictions are being lifted off apartments um, or the loss of what we call naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, so housing that is below market rate that then gets sold uh, largely to corporate landlords where they jack up the rent um, and we lose that. And so both production and preservation are really, really important parts of the equation because it doesn't matter how much we're building on one hand if we're losing a bunch of affordable units and affordable homes on the other side. Um, and so the first question is, right, like how much do we need to build? Um, and so if you've paid attention um, to the administration talking or other people, you hear this number thrown around a lot, right? The Massachusetts needs to build 200,000 more homes by 2030. Um, if we want to click next on the slide, uh, real quick, right? Does it, right? That is the big question. Um, and so we can move to the next slide. So where does this number come from? This $200,000 number that gets thrown around a lot. Um, where does it come from? Where it comes from is a report from McKinsey, uh, right? The, the government um, consultants. Uh, it came from this future of work report that they released during the pandemic. Um, and so it's a thing that comes from uh, McKinsey and it's a pretty straightforward estimate based solely on population growth estimates, right? McKinsey said, here's how much we think the population in uh, Massachusetts is going to grow uh, over the next decade. And based off of that, here's what we think. Um, and so it didn't take into account a lot of other factors. Um, and one of the big uh, gaps here is it did not factor in recommendations around levels of affordability. Um, and so, so there's a question, Lee. So is the 200Ks needed market rate units? Like I was saying, this report doesn't take into account how many of those units need to be affordable. Right, and it says that right in the report. This isn't me trying to trash McKinsey, though I could do that if we wanted. Um, right, this is them saying this was a pretty straightforward math equation that didn't take into account so many factors. And so that 200,000 number, um, right, is really a number not backed uh, in the type of data and research and the things that we care about, right? And so the long and short answer is there isn't a real good estimate on the exact number of units that we need to build, uh, which is really hard. Um, if we want to slow to the next slide. What do we know about what's missing though, right? What we know is we do need to build, right? That's not in dispute. Where it seems the dispute really comes in is how much and what focus should there be on affordability. And what we also know um, is that the greatest need, the highest need when it comes to new construction um, is actually at the lower, lowest income levels. So this um, data, I forgot to credit it on the slide. So my apologies, um, but this is from the national um, low-income housing coalition. And so they put out a report every year known as the gap report, which is basically them saying, here's the gap between the need 
for low income and extremely low income individuals and uh, what is <clears throat> actually there. And so if you look at this graph on the right, the bar chart, what you will see, that's a chart, right? Affordable and available homes per 100 renter households um, at various levels of income. So at ELI, that's shorthand for extremely low income. So those are people living at 30% of the area median income. So what that means is for every 100 people living at 30% of the area median income, there are only 44 available homes. And so what you see as we go across this bar chart is you climbing the AMI. So at 100% of area median income, for every 100 people at that level, there are 98 homes available. Um, and so when we talk about needing housing at every income level, that's true. But what we know from data is as you go up in income, that gap for available housing is shortening quite a bit. Um, and then you see this other, right, this deficit of affordable units for people at 50% AMI or 30% AMI, right? So we are in this, so, you know, we're looking at this range of $200,000, 200,000 units that may not be 100% off, but we know that we're at a deficit simply for people at the lower end of the income um, spectrum, for people living at 30 and 50% of the AMI and even lower, we have this huge gap. Um, and so that's, you know, that's where we know and that's where at MLRI we really focus our advocacy is on creating housing for those people. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, and so, you know, how do we get there? How do we end up with this housing shortage? Um, many of you have likely heard the term exclusionary zoning. Um, and really what that means is zoning that doesn't allow us to build the type of housing that we need. Over 80% of the land in greater Boston is zoned only for single family homes. So that means on those stretches, right, in 80% of greater Boston, the only thing you can build by right um, is single family homes, which means if you were trying to build anything beyond that, even if it's just a triple decker, right, the classic triple decker that is associated with large parts of Boston, um, that is what allowed multiple generations of middle and low income people to buy homes decades ago. You can't build that in most of Boston or in most of Massachusetts anymore. It requires special permits. It requires zoning variances. And those are processes that take years. If you've ever followed a development in your neighborhood for affordable housing or anything else, you know that it takes years. And when it takes years to build something, it means building that becomes far more expensive. And when it when building it is far more expensive, it means selling it and buying it is more expensive, right? And so these are some of the things contributing to just how expensive housing has become um, not just in the greater Boston area, but all over Massachusetts. Because what we know is as Boston becomes more and more expensive, people are pushing out to parts of the state that used to be more affordable. I'm from Western Mass. I was born and raised in Western Mass, right? It used to be a place where you could be middle or low income um, and purchase a home or at least get by as a renter. That is simply not the case anymore. Even in my little hometown of Ware, Massachusetts, uh, which is not exactly a hot tourist destination, um, but people are still being priced out. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, click, all right, so the other question, right, is can we rely on the private market to build the housing stock that we need? Um, so we can click through a couple of times. Um, right. Hint, the answer is no. Uh, sorry, BMBs. Um, right. And so here's what people will say as we talk about this. And I want I, I don't use GMBs that derogatorily. We'll talk about this a lot. We align on a lot of things, um, but not all. <laughs> um, right. So what they will say, uh, right, to support this idea that the private developers, the private market can do this, um, is that if we just ease zoning and permitting and get out of the way of the developers, that they will be able to build. Um, and right, what they will say is that all development is good development and that even market rate and luxury units are actually good for low-income individuals through what's known as um, filtering. Um, and right, it's 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 kind of a version of like trickle-down trickle down economics for housing. Um, and we know how trickle-down economics works, um, right? And this is not to say that I believe that we should be building zero market rate housing. Um, that's not the claim. Um, but if we go to the next slide, um, right, we do we do need to ease zoning restrictions, right? We do need to make building bigger and larger and more homes 
buy right. We need to make that an easier process. We need to make that a cheaper process. Um, and so it it is true. We need housing um, across all levels, but that can't be it, right? When we hear this framing of housing at all income levels, can't pay lip service, oh, right? Housing at all income levels, um, it's often used to bolster this idea that we should be building more market rate housing um, and then affordability, right? Which is one of those levels that we need to build across. Uh, build across um, really becomes a secondary thought. Um, and so I think I've got one more slide. Next. So what do we need to do, um, right? We need massive invest investments from the state and federal government um, to build and preserve the housing that we need, right? That's what we need um, to supplement and make up for what the private market is never going to be able to develop, um, right? So we need investments in public housing. Uh, um, which, you know, lots of people talk about. I know Rep Connolly is here um, and I believe going to be talking about um, social housing, um, an idea that he's been uh, really pushing for here in Massachusetts. Um, things like the real estate transfer fee, uh, which would allow municipalities to collect funds from high-end real estate transactions so that they can help fund the creation of affordable housing in their, um, in their communities. Um, Carolyn already talked about the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act and some other people might as well. That's, again, another part of that preservation piece. Um, the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act is really there. Um, and then investment in things like community land trusts. Um, we don't talk enough about community land trusts. I'm guessing many will do that, so I'm not going to go off on it. Um, but I am on the board of my local community land trust, right? It really is a way to create community control over land and property and to remove those things from the speculative market, which is uh, ultimately, I think, the answer. Um, and then while private developers um, are not going to, will not do this on their own, they are a part of this process. And there are things that we can do to make sure that they are doing their part especially when it comes to affordable housing, um, right? So things like inclusionary zoning policies and linkage fees, right? Some requirement that while you while developers are making these massive profits off of, um, off of development, off of building these market rate housing, they can chip in a little bit. They can build um, these affordable units. Um, and so... You know, those are the pieces. And there are other stuff. Um, I want to be clear, this is not an exhaustive list. I saw someone put in there ADUs, accessory dwelling units. Um, that's, you know, certainly a piece of this puzzle. There's a lot of pieces of the puzzle, right? That's why we have this big, long form with lots of people talking about different things. There are a million different pieces of solving this puzzle. This is just a small piece um, and just some recommendations, like I said, by not by any means an exhaustive list of solutions. And I'm done. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Carolyn and Mark. And and Mark, thank you for that segue. Uh, because next we're going to be focusing on uh two uh two proposals, two innovative uh proposals uh that can meet the housing needs of low-income people and do it without giving away money uh to real estate developers. So first, uh let's learn about community land trust from Minnie McMahon of uh, Dudley Street Community uh, Land Trust. So, many. Hi, everyone. Good evening. It's good to be here with you all. Um, I will do my best to talk about this model and why it matters and mention a couple of policy pieces um, in just these few minutes and definitely encourage folks to um, Google the Greater Boston Community Land Trust Network another time. Um, to learn more and to get in touch if, if you'd like to do that. So we can go to the first slide. Um, what are community land trusts? So sorry, it's a bit wordy, but we'll go step by step. So a community land trust is a nonprofit corporation that owns and stewards land on behalf of a community. Um, and CLTs, the idea is that they, they purchase land um, at market rate or at you know, sub, some sort of subsidized rate, at, if maybe it's city owned land and it's less expensive, um, they'll acquire land and then they'll keep it. They're, they're taking it out of the market and they're holding it, um, they're holding it essentially in trust. So CLTs don't sell the land, instead they'll lease it out to different users for um, mission aligned purposes. So that can mean lots of things and we'll talk about that in a minute. 
So the other piece is, in addition to CLTs, um, taking land out of the market and committing to not selling it and to keeping it affordable, perpet like perpetu forever keeping it um, uh, affordable, um, giving people affordable access to that land. Um, they're also governed by community. That's the idea is that it's not just like a land ownership scheme. It's also about um, let's together decide as the board of the community land trust, as um, members, residents, how we want to see our community built and developed, what we want to see in our land. Let's do community planning together. So the co-ownership of land, co-governance are really key to, to CLTs, or at least our CLTs here in Boston and that are sort of uh, socially justice, social justice aligned. Um, so CLTs fight displacement and preserve community fabric, again, by removing land from the market. Um, and really maintaining its uses according to community priorities. There are about 600 CLTs across the world um, and about 300 in the United States with a little bit over 20 um, in Massachusetts. We can go to the next slide. So, um, oh, maybe let's try a different slide. Um, there's one with a, yeah, thank you. So, so if you look at the bottom, this is just sort of the me little mechanics of the model the green at the bottom, this is CLT owned land we're looking at. So a community land trust will oftentimes own um, sort of scattered site, scattered sites in, in a neighborhood or in a, in a part of a city or a town or whatever. So we're looking at CLT owned land here. The idea is the community land trust owns the land and they'll lease it out for affordable uses. So there's a ground lease, there's a 99 year ground lease. Um, it could be a different amount of time in Massachusetts, 99 years is the legal limit. But the idea is it's it's um, you're signing a lease with a user. Um, the user of that land could be a nonprofit housing um, developer or, or, or uh, that runs rental housing. So a CDC that runs rental housing might lease the land from the community land trust and commit to um, maintaining these affordable units for the length of the lease. Um, you, uh, community land trust can lease land to a homeowner. So homeownership on CLTs is a pretty common use. Um, the idea is that these are homes that are subsidized by um, government dollars. They're, um, you have to be income eligible to buy a CLT home. And when you sell the home, you have to sell it to another income eligible person. So the idea is that that initial public subsidy is being recycled generation after generation to really hold on to the, um, per the affordability of the housing. And every community land trust is gonna have a different equity formula that determines how the home appreciates in value. Um, you can also, CLTs also lease land for open space, farms, gardens, businesses, um, and they can even own their own assets. So some community land trusts might own um, own a rental building that they themselves run. Um, so that's a little bit just about the structure. Um, and again, the idea here is that because the CLT owns the land um, and they're a mission-driven organization, the land is secured for community purpose. So um, you're not at the whim of the market if and and sort of what out what what speculators want. There's no chance that an individual can sell off their home to the highest bidder. The idea is the land is really protected under this covenant that is that is community governed. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, uh, actually, if you could go back to the roots of the CLT, I do like to lift up that. Um, there are so many different ways that we human beings <laughs> treat land and housing and um, community land trusts are, are one model. Um, I wanna point to some of the roots of the community land trust. If you look back to last century um, and certain sort of um, taxation philosophies in England and the United States around, rather than having you know individual people who own land um, sort of capture the public value that's created by, you know, like a place being gentrified, um, the, the land, like the sort of economic value of a place should be shared among the people. So there's some sort of theory about taxation and, and sharing like community wealth and rather than private accumulation of publicly produced value. 
Um, there is some precedent in um, anti-colonial struggles in South Asia and India in redistribution of land um, uh, after um, independence in India um, and, and work to, for, for wealthy landowners um, redistributing land back to communities, but not, not just to individual non-landowning people, but into, um, into trust into, so that communities could sort of co-own and co-govern land. And then also looked at examples of um, like the kibbutz, kibbutzim and moshav communities in Israel. Um, and, and those um, sort of examples of co-ownership of land, of co-ownership of economic production in the case of um, uh, sort of agricultural movements in Israel, um, paired also with individual leaseholds or individual ability um, to, you know, so you can have your own residence, it, not everything has to be collective, but there's some um, sort of pairing the individual leasehold and ability to own something with um, more collective principles and sort of multi-generational outlook. Um, and of course, you know, these are some roots of this particular model. Um, of course, uh, many uh, cultures do not support and have never supported the commodification of land um, in the way that we do in the mainstream economy here. So um, the first CLT um, was came to be in Southwest Georgia out of the civil rights movement. A lot of those folks were really inspired by, by some of these um, examples here. I'm gonna move on to the, um, the policy asks. And, um, but again, we'd really love to connect more with folks about this um, should you care to. So um, as my colleagues, partners, friends um, have talked about, really again the preservation of housing keeping land you know away from speculation for like housing as a public good um the clts are looking a lot at acquiring existing housing um from the market buying it and then attaching um like long-term affordability measures to it right so bringing it onto clt portfolios taking it out of the speculative market rehabilitating housing keeping tenants in place so that when the home goes up for sale, it doesn't get flipped, it, it comes onto a community land trust. And, and that can include the potential, you know, renting to own or becoming an owner. But in any case, really, we're trying to actively um, acquire and preserve existing housing. The small, um, low unit count housing is really trickling away in this, across the state. It's very hard to fund the acquisition of a single home or five units or 10 units. So we're really looking at creating a source of funding from the state um, that can subsidize the purchase of small properties by community land trusts or community development corporations, anyone who's, who's committed to, um, you know, middle, at least midterm um, preservation of that, of those housing as, a, as that housing as affordable. We did pass a pilot program in 2022. So there's some appetite from the legislature we're working with the state now to implement that pilot. And we're also asking the legislature through the housing um, bond bill to make this program permanent and fully, fully capitalize it. Um, Carolyn mentioned TOPA. That's another thing we're standing behind very strongly, the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act. So if TOPA passes um, and tenants have are more easily have the right to buy their homes, something like the Small Property State Acquisition Fund could come in to support um, the purchase of that home if, if, the, you know, if the tenant partners with the CLT or CDC. Um, so that's my time. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Minnie. And uh, our final presenter is Representative Mike Connolly of uh, Cambridge and Somerville. Uh, Representative Connolly grew up in a housing project and uh, when he entered the, uh, the House, he used his firsthand knowledge of housing issues uh, to drive his support for measures that would change housing for all, making him a, a leading legislative uh, advocate for housing. Uh, this year, he introduced a bill on social housing and urged Governor Healy to fund this project. Uh, here to tell you what social housing can do for us uh, is Representative Mike Connolly. So, Representative. Uh, and if you can just unmute. Awesome. Can you hear me now? 
Yes. Terrific. Well, well, thank you so much, uh, Jean-Luc, and good evening uh, to everyone. This has been such a powerful program this evening, and uh, thank you to the Mass Progressive Action Organizing Committee, and I wanted to say a special thank you to my constituent, Henry Wardis, uh, for all the work you've done with the housing justice groups to organize this. Um, for anyone who doesn't know me, uh, my name is Mike Conley. I, I represent parts of Cambridge and Somerville in the state legislature. Uh, I serve on the legislature's joint committee on housing. Uh, this session, I co-founded the Housing for All Legislative Caucus. Uh, as was mentioned, I was raised in public housing. My mom uh, continues to live in a Section 8 unit back in Norwood, where I grew up. I'm a renter here in Cambridge, and, and like so many in my generation, without the benefit of generational wealth, there's no real path to home ownership in the community where I live and where I work. And that really all underscores the fact that we are in this unprecedented housing emergency. Never in our history has affordable housing been this out of reach to so many people, uh, and never in our history has homelessness been this pervasive. And so all of the solutions you've heard about this evening uh, are so important. Um, and what I'm here to talk about in particular is social housing. And, uh, you know, people wonder what is social housing? Essentially, uh, at its core, it is publicly financed mixed income housing. And if you go all the way back 100 years ago to the start of uh, public housing programs in the United States, and you look through the history, a lot of the original thinking around public housing in this country was that it would be available to people with a range of incomes. And we went down that road for just a few years, and it was actually the banks and the real estate industry that said, wait a minute, people are going to love this. We need to make public housing only for poor people. And so that policy was set. And of course, the implication there was to really sabotage it, to set it up so it wouldn't be politically strong. And that's exactly what happened. And that brings us up to the 1980s and the 1990s when things like the fair cloth rule uh, were implemented that uh, actually made it impossible in many ways to continue adding to the stock of our public housing. Uh, we heard from uh, Mark Martinez earlier about some of the different needs for housing in some of the different constraints. And so it's important to realize, especially if you think on the federal level, um, all of the available subsidy for housing gets used. It's not as if there's some additional subsidy available out there that isn't being used. We're using all of our available subsidy to create affordable housing. At the same time, when it comes to market rate housing, we're limited by what investors are willing to do. And of course, that is complicated and constrained by the fact uh, that we're living in this moment of unprecedented wealth and income inequality. The racial wealth gap has actually become many times worse over the past few decades, for example. So uh, bringing this back to social housing, um, again, this is publicly financed mixed income housing, typically owned by a local housing authority uh, or a related entity. And, you know, to really think about it, if you want to simplify how housing production financing works, usually when developers want to go out and just build a project, it's not actually that hard to get a bank mortgage. A bank might say to a developer, sure, we'll give you two thirds of the money that you need. We want to be first in line to be repaid. And now you have to go out and find construction financing to get the rest of the deal. And if some other investor is willing to give you that second piece of financing, we'll be first in line and we'll give you your mortgage. And as you can imagine, that second piece of financing, the construction financing, uh, tends to be uh, expensive. That is where speculative investors will make an investment in a project. So under the social housing model, what we do is we capitalize as a commonwealth a social housing production revolving loan fund. We then turn to the professionals uh, at Mass Housing, our, our housing finance agency, where they have a great deal of built-in uh, capacity and knowledge. And we say, you will administer this fund and you will allow municipalities being led by local housing authorities 
who can work in partnership with CDCs or nonprofits to essentially apply to the fund uh, for financing to do a project on the local level. Then uh, the project gets built like any other project. They will contract with the same engineers, architects, and builders who might build a market rate project. But the difference is now, instead of that project being obligated to pay back those investors who would have offered the construction financing at a significant interest rate, they only have to pay back the state at a nominal interest rate to replenish the social housing production revolving loan fund. Um, when you think about that, you know there's something really powerful to think about. Uh, when you think of the ways that we really invest in affordable housing or in helping people's housing in dollars, there's really two main ways, and that is uh, tax credits, low-income housing tax credits, or housing vouchers. Both tax credits and vouchers, they do one thing once, and then the money's out the door and it's gone forever. In the case of a tax credit, it might help subsidize one affordable unit and then the money never comes back. In the case of a housing voucher, it might keep a family housed for one year, and then the money is in the hands of a landlord and it never comes back. One of the beauties and one of the powers of this social housing model is the Commonwealth invests in these publicly owned mixed income projects. And then over the next several years, as the buildings are leased up and rents are collected, the money goes back to the social housing revolving loan fund to go ahead and finance future projects. So uh, that's a little bit of the overview. Now I'll talk a little bit about the process and where we're at um, with this concept in this legislative session. When the session started, uh, I partnered with Paul Williams, who is an economist, a leading national expert on social housing. He's the founder of the Center uh, for Public Enterprise in New York City. Uh, we drafted legislation uh, called an act establishing the Massachusetts social housing program. We actually finished drafting it in May, and I was really grateful that Chair Arciero and Chair Edwards prioritized it to get it before the Housing Committee in late June, where we had a hearing. I was grateful the city of Somerville came and testified in support of the bill. Uh, then I met with uh, Housing Secretary at Augustus and started talking to the Healy Driscoll administration and really started pitching the idea to them. And, you know, one of the things I mentioned to them, this isn't just pie in the sky conceptual. In Montgomery County, Maryland, they started this social housing production revolving loan fund about a decade ago, and it's been a fabulous success. There was a huge feature in the New York Times back in August, where they went to many of these buildings, they met with the tenants, and they concluded this is working uh, terrifically. Um, from there, uh, the governor included uh, an authorization to begin a social housing pilot program in her bond bill filing. And so as you may have heard, I think we've seen from some of the other slides, a week from tomorrow, the Joint Committee on Housing will be having a hearing on that bill. And so on this particular topic, really our message is, let's keep that social housing pilot program in the bond bill. Uh, let's go ahead as a legislature and move that forward. Uh, and then the plan from there would be to let uh, the Office of Housing and Livable Communities uh, come up with a regulatory process to work out the final details. And then from there, Mass Housing can start accepting applications from municipalities. We've had very uh, constructive meetings uh, with the city of Boston, the city of Cambridge, the city of Somerville, uh, as well as many of the uh, housing advocacy groups. I got about a minute left here. So, um, you know, one final point that I'll mention that I think ties some of the things that you've heard together. Again, uh, the subsidies that are available for housing are so constrained. And so, one of the things we can do with this social housing model is without relying on any other public subsidy, without any tax credits, without any voucher money, we could actually cover the need for, let's say, 60% AMI up to 100% AMI, where we could be doing these social housing developments 
they would be cross subsidized with certain market rate units in the development and we would be providing affordable housing without any other public subsidy to that sort of middle of the range in the affordability range and then what that will do is it will let us take our existing scarce resources and concentrate them to the lowest end where the need is the greatest and really give us a fighting chance to meet everyone's needs. So I'm at nine minutes, 55 seconds. I'll I'll stop there. I'm going to put in the chat um, a letter that we're collecting signatures for, a sign-on letter. And then I'll also put a blog post that has links and sort of definitions about all this stuff I tried to cover really quickly. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Representative. Um, as we... Um... As we turn to close, I was just uh, listening to a lot of our, uh, to all of our speakers and, and presenters, um, really even just thinking about uh, my own personal uh, experiences with housing insecurity. Of course, uh, the reason why I'm here in Massachusetts is tied back to loss of home during Hurricane Katrina. Um, so there's many different ways uh, in which our communities face homelessness and we the the face of homelessness uh we hope that we have a given depth uh to that picture uh but we also hope that we have a uh, depth and breadth uh to all of the solutions that we've highlighted tonight only a few of the pieces of the puzzle uh but what you can do uh at this time uh we have a few calls to action so we have a, a QR code for you to scan It'll send you to our link tree, um, link tree slash MA housing crisis. Um, uh, so uh, scan that. It'll uh, link you to the websites of all of our participating organizations. Uh, we also ask that you plan to offer testimony on Governor Healy's bond bill. It includes a pilot for a social housing program. Uh, which would allow for local real estate transfer fees and seal old eviction records. Uh, we also ask that you get involved with housing work within your own uh, favorite organization. Um, and uh, this is not the only time that you will be able to see this video. We're going to actually uh, post a video of this forum uh, to YouTube. Uh, so we're going to be sharing that information with all the registrants by email. So we hope that you continue to circulate uh, the information and continue the conversation. Uh, I want to thank our, our coordinating team. It certainly was a, a pleasure to bring all of this information to you. Uh, we're going to contact you with information about our next housing forum. Uh, so with that, we want to say good night. Um, and also uh, declare right now that housing is a human right. Thank you all and good night. Take care.